welcome everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining us for this, this noon session of the Celebration of Minds, um, the G4G Virtual Celebration of Minds 2020. As you know, this is an event to, to honor Martin Gartner's legacies and interests. For this session, we have with us Janine Mosley, who holds a PhD in Electric Engineering and Computer Sciences from the MIT and works at Akamai Technologies, but she might be best known for her origami. This will be her talk. And without further notice, I will pass over to Janine to speak about, about counterproductivity in minimalist origami. The title of this talk is a little bit of a joke, and um, it may not be obvious right now what the joke is, but I think you'll see it later. So origami, of course, I hope you all know, is the Japanese art of paper folding, and minimalist origami is, well, it's making origami with very few folds. So a little bit of background here. In the mid-1990s, um, uh, a uh, folder Jean Jerome Casalonga proposed his idea of minimalist origami and he uh, suggested that the designer be limited to at most four creases and uh, that's not a lot so um, it's kind of hard to imagine what you can make with only four folds um, but I responded to his challenge by creating uh, a complete alphabet now, Jean Jerome was not the first origamist to play with um, minimalist origami. Uh, the very uh, wonderful uh, British folder, Paul Jackson, uh, did a series of one crease origami models that are uh, sort of abstract, impressionistic, but I think you'll see very lovely. And another, uh, a number of other folders have designed minimalist origami. So, um, Joseph Wu has the one fold stegosaurus and that needs to be made from a sheet of um, paper that is, is colored on both sides, preferably green. Uh, I came up with this two fold ski resort using origami paper, which is white on one side and uh, colored on the other. And Paula Versnick um, created this marvelous two fold Santa. Um, uh, most people can see it, but if, if some people don't get it right off the bat, you'll notice that he has a red cap and a white beard and a white sack on his back and long red robes. So that's Santa. And, uh, and then this fourfold heart, which I designed, but also a number of other folders have come up with it independently because it's a fairly obvious design, I think. Um, but here is my alphabet. Uh, and this is the full Roman alphabet. Every letter here uh, is made with just four creases. And of course, that's not enough to have an uppercase alphabet. We need a lowercase alphabet as well. So um, back to the title of the talk. What is it about? It's about counters and how to produce them. So in typography, a counter is an area of paper that's been sur surrounded by ink. And there are two kinds of counters, closed counters, like the, um, the one in the A and the two in the B, and open counters, like uh, the counter in C. But for the purposes of this talk, we're only going to consider closed counters. And when I say counter, I'm going to be meaning a closed counter, an area completely surrounded by ink, or in this case, um, by col a different color of paper. And uh, so in the Roman alphabet, no letter has more than two counters, uh, but there are plenty of characters in other alphabets and writing systems that have more than two counters. These uh, characters from the Ge'ez script have three counters. And here we have even more counters in some uh, <laughs> less well-known writing systems. Uh, these are a little frightening. I don't think I could uh, even begin to attempt any of these in four creases. <laughs> But uh, so that, that brings us to <clears throat> the meat of the, of the talk, which is we're going to investigate how many counters C it is possible to fold using F creases. And it turns out that um, the number of counters is quadratic in the number of folds, which I found to be a pretty surprising result. Initially, I thought we probably couldn't do better than linear. Um, so, it's not too hard to prove that you cannot make any counters with a single fold. I'm not gonna uh, go into the details of that today. 
but it's pretty easy to demonstrate that you can produce one counter with two folds. And furthermore, uh, each I, there's a, a method where I can add another fold to the figure on the right and produce two counters and then add another fold to that and produce three and so on um, so that you can definitely get n counters with n plus one folds. So we, we start with the figure from the previous slide and we focus on that triangle and by simply folding the tip down, we've turned one counter into two Folding it up again, we've turned two counters into three, fold that tip down again, etc. So you can get always get n counters with n plus one folds. So before we can really ask the question, how many um, counters can you get with a fixed number of folds, you need to have some rules for what constitutes a fold and what we count and what we don't count. So uh, rule number one is pretty obvious. A crease is defined by a straight line along which the paper is folded. And rule number two says that we can unfold or fold any subset of stacked layers of paper. And um, rule number three says that uh, when you make a fold, all the layers of paper have to go in the same direction. You can't make a crease and then say have um, some of the layers folding one to one side and the other layers folding to the other direction. So um, <clears throat> rule number four says you're allowed to unfold a crease that you've already made without counting that as a new fold. And uh, rule number five is a little hard to understand um, and I'm gonna explain it in more detail with the next slide. And the last rule uh, says that we can put a crease anywhere we want to. We don't have to um, fold landmarks in advance. We, you know, if, if, if I say I want a crease halfway uh, from here to there, I can just put it there without actually doing any construction to uh, set it up. Um, so rule number five, explaining about rule number five. The idea here is we have uh, two little triangles and we can fold them uh, both as long as it's on the same line we're only going to count that as one fold um, and if you have a problem with that we'll talk more about it later <laughs> so this shows that if somehow we could arrange to create two uh, triangles that were lined up with each other as shown in the picture uh, we would be able to add uh, two counters with each additional fold. And so instead of getting um, uh, only um, n, n counters for n plus one folds, we would get two n counters for c plus n folds, where c is some constant. We don't know what it is. It's however many uh, folds we had to make to get to this point of having the two triangles that are lined up. Well, um, can we do that? Of course we can do that. Can we do more triangles lined up? Can we get like K triangles lined up in a row and then make folds that produce K additional counters with each new crease? Yes. And here's a method for creating a row of K triangles. And we take our square with the white side up and we make a series of uh, diagonal pleats uh, for those of you who are not um, origami experts, the dashed dot line uh, denotes a mountain fold. That means we're folding the paper behind. And a dashed line means that we are making a valley fold. We're folding the paper forward. So this creates a series of, of pleats. Um, and uh, after we make the diagonal pleats, we make a series of um, horizontal pleats. I'm sorry, vertical pleats. Um, and you'll notice that we don't finish the last pleat on either of these. So uh, we just make the, the first crease of it and not the second. And so if we're trying to produce K triangles, uh, we'll end up making 4K minus two creases to, to create um, the figure we see in the next slide, the one on the left. So, so far, no triangles and no uh, counters at all. And the left-hand figure, 
but we've made uh, four uh, k minus two creases. Now we a make another crease and we get the central figure. Still no, no triangles, no counters yet, except we do have the triangles ready to go with one more crease. Uh, we get the figure on the right. And now we have three triangles and every subsequent crease is going to produce K additional counters. So um, what does that get us? Um, well, if you add up the numbers of counters and creases, you'll see that the number of folds we make is um, 4k minus 1, that's to set up the triangles, and then n is the number of times we flip those triangles back and forth, and the number of counters we get is going to be k times n. So if we rearrange uh, the first equation and substitute it into the second equation, we get a formula for the number of counters in the number of folds for a fixed number of triangles. So what we want to do now is find the value of k, the number of triangles we're shooting for, that will maximize the number of counters we can make for the number of folds we're allowed. And to do that, we can just fall back on elementary uh, calculus, take uh, the derivative of the function, set it equal to zero, and we find that the optimum k is the number of folds plus one over eight, and the number of counters that will be produced if we substitute that k back into the previous equation is f plus one over four squared. The number of counters is a quadratic function of the number of folds. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, what about that rule five? Why are we counting this as two, as, as one fold. Shouldn't we really be counting this as two folds? Come on, this is two folds, isn't it? You know, we're kind of cheating here, right? We're cheating. Well, no, we're not. Because we folded down, if, if instead of like just folding those two triangles down, we fold the paper that's behind them down with it all at once, we're folding all the layers of paper with a single crease, and then we unfold the top half and leave the triangles down, then that's only one fold because we don't have to count unfolding. So this is really only one fold. But seriously, come on, isn't this two folds? I think it's two folds. It's just, why are, why are we not counting the unfolding? Maybe we should be counting the unfolding, huh? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's just throw out rules four and five and see what happens. So we're gonna, when we unfold, we're gonna count it, all right? So we get to here, we've made four K minus one creases and it will take us two more folds to get those first K counters. And what it does to our equations is here, instead of F equals four K minus one plus N, it's two N. And uh, of course C is still K N. Um, Oh no, it should be two. Um, anyway, we, we plug it in, we rearrange, we take the derivative, um, we set it equal to zero, and we still have we still have the uh, uh, optimum k as uh, f plus one over over eight. Uh, it's just that when we plug it back into the formula for the number of counters, instead of f plus 1 squared over 16, we have f plus 1 squared over 32. But it's still quadratic. So it doesn't actually matter if we keep rules 4 or 5 and 5 or not. It's still quadratic. So what about the fractions? Most of the time f plus 1 over 8 isn't an integer. Well, it turns out that if you just round it down or up to the closest integer, you'll get the optimum value. So um, now we have to ask an interesting question. When do we break even? That is to say, um, um, how large does F have to be before this method will get you more counters than the linear method? And the answer is F equals 15, because at, at, at 15 folds, we, this algorithm will produce 16 counters instead of, uh, instead of just 14. And after that, it goes up uh, really, really dramatically. For example, if F equals 96, you can, 95, you can get 
576 counters. So uh, there's lots of other things to investigate and prove. Um, I haven't proven that you can't get two counters in two folds. I believe it, but I haven't proven it. Um, so that, that needs to be investigated. And I don't think you can get three counters in three folds or four in four folds, but I have in fact made five counters with five folds. I'm gonna hold this up to the camera and see if you can see it. Okay, um, I know I'm off in the corner in a little tiny window, but this uh, has five counters. Uh, one of them's quite small and it's a little hard to see. And it was made with exactly five folds. So you can do that. Um, and finally, the question is, can we get it any better than a quadratic? I don't know. Anyway, um, that's all for counter productivity. But just for fun, I thought I would show you some slides of um, some more minimalist origami. Um, ever since I created my fourfold alphabet many years ago, uh, people have asked me, why four folds? And I always answered, because you can't do it in three. I guess I was wrong about that. This is my uppercase threefold alphabet. And this is my lowercase threefold alphabet. And uh, in case you weren't paying careful attention, this slide and this were both made with the threefold alphabet, not the fourfold. So that's kind of cool. So before I start telling everyone that you can't do it in two, I have to ask, can you read this? So here's my twofold uppercase alphabet. And of course, um, we're sacrificing counters all over the place. The O lacks a counter, the A lacks a counter, the B lacks both of its counters. But in context, it's still legible. Individually, none of the letter, most of the letters, you know, will not read as what, what they're intended to be. But when you start putting them together, you, you, you find yourself able to read them. And here is the lowercase twofold alphabet. And uh, just in case you didn't notice, this slide was done using the twofold alphabet. And that's all. Thank you. I had no idea about the existence of this before your 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 talk, and and now I really want to fi uh, find out more. Is there is there any place we we can check out and read more? Yeah, uh, Jeremy Schaefer uh, has a book. I think the title is Minimalist Origami. I'm not sure. Uh, Jean Jerome Casalonga also has a book. Hi. So uh, the folds you are doing so far are all fold all the way across, and I'm wondering how you would count a, um, a reverse fold or something like that, and whether that kind of fold might be a way to get more counters. If, if people in the audience don't know what Andy is referring to, I have a little origami paper here. I'm going to, um, I'm just folding it in half like that. A reverse fold is essentially, it's what you do to make the beak on a, on a bird. Um, and so, how do you count that? How many creases is that? And I feel like, okay, um, if you're here and you make this fold, that's one fold, okay? But then flipping it the other way, we're not counting unfolding. So I don't know if we should count uh, reversing the fold because it, there's something in common with, once you put the hinge in, does it matter whether you fold it to one side or the other? Or you, do you have to count it again if you fold it to the other side? So let's suppose that we, we don't count reversing it. Then, because we have the creases in place and we only made two creases at this point, we should be allowed uh, to reverse it and, and again, not, not count that as any additional creases. Is there a rule regarding the initial shape of the paper? Uh, that's uh, I 
just assume that I'm starting with a square, but you know, um, you can start with other shapes. The thing is that um, if you just, if you have a square and it's not the shape you want, let's say you, you wanted to work from a rectangle that was one by two, then you could just fold your paper in half. Of course, the problem with doing that is now that you've folded it in half and you have your one by two rectangle, it's blue on both sides or colored on both sides. So you really need a way to uh, fold it in half uh, that still preserves the, uh, um, the colored on one side and, and, and not on the other. And so one, an additional crease will produce my one by two rectangle that is white and blue. And usually what it means is that there's a constant number of creases that you have to make to start with to transform your square into the proportions of the paper that you were interested in working with. And so, you know, constants just, they don't affect the asymptotic behavior of the algorithm, the number of creases you have to make to get your, your counters. And the comment also from the chat is, I suspect that if you were allowed to start with an uh, irregular shape, say a swath tooth border, you could get unlimited counters in a small number of holes. Yeah. I prefer to start with convex shapes in general. I mean, if, you, if you're allowed to start with an arbitrary shape initially, then you can kind of get anything you want in like one fold. And well, maybe not one, two, two folds. <laughs> so another question is, is there an origami that starts with circles? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Oh, my God. I've forgotten his name. There's a man in Chicago who does the most incredible things with paper plates circular paper plates. Somebody in the chat mentions Bradford Hanson Smith and he has, he doesn't call it origami, that's the thing, but it is, he folds them. And, it, but he uses them as, as, as modules. So it's like, you know, modular origami, you fold many sheets of paper and uh, join them together. But, but there are other people who've done work with circles. I, I came into a, a quantity of circular paper. It, they're actually, <laughs> It's, it's actually parchment paper from a, a defunct pizza chain. So <laughs> I have a big stack of circular paper waiting for me to play with, but I, I haven't done much with it yet. So, Janine, I would like to thank you once more and uh, for this, this really amazing talk. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.